more scope for co-thinking and co-helping, I would say, the Commission with some very practical actions that can also be relevant for the companies that are uh, here in uh, this webinar, but also the national partner organizations working on CSR and all the other stakeholders. So thank you very much for that. We will not stop with this webinar. We will continue the job um, also with regard to the non-binding guidelines uh, for the companies and the national networks of CISA Europe. We have a, a webinar on the 6th of April uh, to finalize also our positions on the non-binding guidelines. But now uh, I think the agenda is full enough and we have all wise and smart and daring uh, people and organizations that can uh, get us through already a piece of implementation or transposition of this directive. Thank you very much, Jan. Uh, thank you very much for your kind words. If I can add something to that. Um, indeed, the idea of this platform um, came up to um, uh, Jirai and Cesar Europe together, uh, having perceived the uh, need for coordination. Uh, the success of this uh, initiative is um, uh, based on the fact that some 30 members, member organizations, populated this platform. Uh, they are from all the uh, EU and uh, EFTA uh, member states, which are the member states of the EU, which are um, uh, covering, which are now implementing the Directive on Non-Financial Reporting. Uh, the idea was to um, collect, analyze, and share information about how governments are transposing the Directive, what are the activities that the governments and the stakeholders have initiated locally to support an efficient and effective transposition of the directive, as well as assessing the gaps in terms of capacity building or stakeholder needs to, um, uh, to, um, to help you know, the, uh, the swift implementation of the directive. For those of you who are um, um, not totally familiar with the directive, this was adopted in December 2014, therefore EU member states have time till December 2016 to uh, transpose into national legislation. Um, the objective was to increase EU companies' transparency and performance on uh, sustainability issues and contribute effectively to uh, uh, a smart growth. The scope of the directive um, covers large public interest entities uh, with more than 500 employees, and this includes listed companies, which means you know companies listed on European stock exchanges, credit institutions, insurance undertakings, and any other um, uh, uh, public interest entity that the member states will qualify as such. As an estimate that European Commission made, some 6,000 companies in the EU should be covered by this uh, legislation. So what's happening now? Um, at the moment, um, we are aware that Denmark, Slovakia, and Estonia have already transposed the EU directive into national legislation. Denmark enlarged the scope, and we will hear today later on uh, from uh, representatives from, um, from Denmark about you know, how it's going there. While Slovakia and Estonia have been implemented, have been transposing into national legislation, meeting the minimum requirements of the directive. Uh, we are aware that many other um, countries are in the process of transposing. Um, some of those are actually running uh, consultations, but we're coming to that in a bit. Um, now we are aware of the processes going on in France, Germany, UK, Czech Republic, Belgium, Greece, and I will add Italy as well. Um, as out of curiosity, just to get an understanding, this, in this slide you will get um, some data about the number of com companies affected by country, but this is not an official data. This is something that we've been uh, collecting um, through the platform, so thanks to the 30 members of the uh, EU non-financial reporting um, uh, platform, and you will see uh, what is you know, the, um, um, the country um, uh, breakdown of the companies affected by, by the directive. Of course, you know, whether you want to, um, uh, to know what are the final, the final numbers, um, uh, you should indeed consult with your own government. And of course, you know, not all the countries are included in this table. Those are just the countries that we are aware of. Um, 
how to participate? How can you uh, engage in the process of um, uh, national implementation, national transposition? Um, the European Commission is um, uh, currently undergoing through an open consultation on the non-binding guidelines. The, um, um, uh, the, uh, the European Parliament gave mandate approving the, uh, the directive. So the institutions gave mandate to the European Commission to develop those non-binding guidelines on the methodology for reporting on financial information. The timeline for this uh, is, um, uh, goes hand in hand with the uh, national transposition, so the non-binding guidelines will be approved by December uh, this year. But indeed at the moment there is an open consultation. So um, uh, we will circulate the presentation after the webinar. You can click on the links and you can actually access to the European consultation. The deadline, very important, is 15th of April. So we have something like three weeks to go. Um, there are other consultations. At the moment, another one um, open is the one done by the uh, UK government. Um, uh, we are aware as well of some upcoming ones, including the, uh, the uh, Italian one. Uh, I will now uh, give the floor to uh, um, Richard Howitt, member, elected member of the European Parliament uh, since 1994 and um, uh, CSR Rapporteur for the European Parliament um, uh, for three uh, consequent mandates at the European Parliament. Uh, Richard has been one of the father of this directive, and I will say even more, is the um, point of reference, not only within Europe, but uh, even outside of Europe, when it comes to uh, CSR non-financial reporting. Uh, I'm just seeking confirmation, is Richard online? I have not seen him online yet, so I'm afraid he's not here yet. Yeah, he actually should be uh, online by the phone. Richard, can you hear us? No. Why? Um, I propose we will, therefore. We will solve it. Maybe we can move ahead with the others and then uh, we can solve the problem in the meantime. Exactly. Yeah, thank you very much, Yvette. So um, uh, we'll come back to Richard. I'm pretty sure that all of you will be curious to hear uh, Richard's view and perspective on uh, the implementation of the EU non-financial directive. I will now give the floor to um, um, uh, our local champions uh, to hear, you know, perspectives from uh, uh, different countries. I will actually um, uh, kick off uh, with Denmark, uh, giving the floor to uh, Louis Koch from the uh, Danish Chamber of Commerce and uh, Pernil Rysgaard, FSR, Danish Auditors, Denmark. Uh, Louise um, Pernil, would you share, you know, um, uh, the successful example of the uh, Danish transposition? Yes, certainly. Um, are you all hearing me? Yes, loud and clear. Yes, good. So, so it's our pleasure, thank you, to, uh, to share the state of play of CSR reporting in Denmark. And as you might know, we've had some CSR reporting framework since 2009. We will share a bit about that, then on the implementation of the EU directive in Denmark and the learnings both from the former EU uh, CSR reporting and now with implementation of the directive. So I will go ahead with the current state of play in Denmark. And um, as mentioned, we've had a legal requirement on CSR reporting since 2009, which has been covering um, the largest uh, 1,100 companies, basically companies with more than 250 employees and some certain turnover criteria. Uh, the format of this uh, reporting has been that the companies should um, inform and, and, um, and share if they had a CSR policy uh, or inform if they didn't. So, um, and uh, apart from the CSR policy, then on actions and results on specific uh, topics, um, also on climate change and human rights. And it was also expected that the company should uh, inform consistently about the actions and results to areas that were covered by the policy. And this has not been a standalone reporting requirement, but has also been supported by a national action plan for strengthening of strategic CSR in Denmark, including um, a national CSR council, including uh, tools for companies to work with CSR strategically and also capacity building on, on companies. 
Um, the Danish Business Business Authority have also been quite good at um, at engaging SMEs in um, in CSR capacity building efforts and programs. Now, with the new EU directive, it was actually implemented um, and enforced already from this year, 2016, for the public interest entities. Um, because there was a, re a revision last year in 2015 of the existing accounting framework in Denmark, so so this EU directive just they came in the loop here as well. Um, obviously, the new uh, so the new re reporting requirements are aligned with the EU directives. The criteria that you have your CSR policy on the listed themes, and also as a company, um, if you don't have your CSR policy, you should now explain why you don't have it. So that's um, of course, a step up from uh, from informing. Um, also, uh, there's now uh, the reporting on the business model and the due diligence process and risks and KPIs and and these added um, elements in the reporting framework. Currently, from 2016, the scope is covering approximately 50 listed and public companies in Denmark, and um, and and then. Uh, also, the criteria will apply to the remaining 1,050 companies uh, who are already reporting according to the Danish framework. They will be included um, in the EU criteria from 2018. So basically, they have been given, you could say, two years to, to prepare for this. Now, that was in short what is uh, entailed. Some of the discussion points that we have had um, in the public consultation and the hearings regarding implementation of the directive um, has, of course, been whether to to have different CSR reporting criteria for medium and large companies or one framework for all. Because it is the CSR or the EU criteria uh, with, uh, for, for reporting are, are some, somewhat um, uh, more comprehensive than, than the existing Danish, Danish ones. But it was decided to have one framework, at least from 2018, although it was also acknowledged that um, that this could be be a burden for for also the the rest of the companies. But since they are already reporting um, on some terms, the government uh, meant that, that it wouldn't be too much of an extra burden. Uh, but definitely, that was also a discussion whether or not uh, this would be an extra administrative burden uh, compared to a competitive advantage. And I think this is definitely a discussion that we can have also at a European level. And last but not least, also following what uh, Jan said in the, in the introduction, um, again, we can only stress that it's not enough just to have the reporting framework. There's also a need for supporting capacity building of companies, not only to do the reporting, but also to get the policies and processes in place so that they have a proper CSR process to, to report about. So that was the first part from us. I will uh, give the word now to Pernilia. Who I hope is with us. <laughs> She's coming on, yes. Thank, thank you, Luis. Can you all hear me? Yes, please, yes. go ahead. Thank you, thank you. So adding on to, to what Luisa just uh, just said with the CSR reporting requirements embedded in the Danish Financial Statements Act since 2009, uh, the government has initiated um, a number of annual assessments to evaluate the state of the implementation. And generally speaking, it's important to see reporting as a vehicle in the implementation of the business-driven CSR, um, and the evaluation can give us an indication of how companies are working with CSR and, of course, the uptake um, of the reporting requirements. Um, so in a Danish perspective, implementation and compliance has increased year on year, and the number uh, from the reporting year 2013 show that nearly all companies are reporting and that 77% of the common companies who report have CSR policies. So the rest have, up until now, just informed in their reporting that they don't have policies in place. So if we look at the overall population of the companies covered by the Danish reporting requirement, CSR is seen to have been on the management agenda, and the larger companies are generally in compliance. Um, and as the new EU requirement targets the larger companies, one could expect that some, or at least most of the European companies covered by the 
uh, director will be more or less compliant if CSR is already um, high on the agenda. <clears throat> what characterizes the Danish company's CSR approach is that international principles increasingly are being referred to in the reporting and that quite, quite a few comply with the requirements through their reporting to the UN Global Compact. In terms of CSR themes, uh, environment, climate change and the human resource area are seen as, as central to most companies in the latest evaluation from the business authorities. So the evaluations have been an instrument for the government and the business authorities to identify the support needed amongst the business community, both in terms of implementing business-driven CSR and in terms of understanding the reporting requirements. Um, the government has had action plans, as Louisa mentioned, and specific programs and initiatives to develop tools and guidelines and testing of approaches. Um, and we believe some of this could be replicated or, or scaled across across the EU. Uh, <clears throat> moving into the uh, challenges and opportunities in view of the EU directive, um, we've heard a number of companies who see the requirements as further supporting the strategic and internal CSR agenda in the companies. And interestingly enough, a recent Danish analysis looking at companies reporting to the UN Global Compact as well as their financial reporting for the reporting year 2015 shows that those companies are largely in compliance with the requirements of the EU directive. However, the risk reporting comes out as one of the areas where most companies need to improve their reporting. This analysis also highlights the UN Global Compact management model as a key tool um, as it touches on the areas requested by the directive. So Wonderful. Course, Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for cutting you. Are you mm -hmm. closing? Please, one, uh, one last sentence. One last sentence. Um, <clears throat> I think in, in terms of um, following up to the guidelines being published later this year, um, of course, um, a, a EU-wide good practice um, examples could, could serve as a good service for companies in follow-up to the first years of implementation. Wonderful. Thank you very much for having shared the uh, experience from Denmark. As you uh, rightly said, Denmark has been the first country to implement the EU non-financial reporting directive and one of the first countries in Europe in regulating this topic. So thank you very much for uh, having shared your insights on this. I would like now to uh, jump one item back on our agenda. We, um, we have now Richard Howitt, MEP, with us. Um, uh, Richard, can I just, you know, confirm that you are online now and that you can uh, indeed speak? We've been having problems in hearing, Richard, and I think that we are still having some problems there. Yvette, is Richard unmuted? Yes, I'm, I'm here, but I cannot see him in the list. So if it's a calling user. If can he please write a message in the chat function so that I know who it is? Because no. I cannot I have various anonymous callers and I do not see the name, so I cannot unmute pe a person if I don't know who it is. Can you try to unmute a couple of seconds? Everybody the person? No. So is Howitt, Mr. Howitt, if you are in the, um, in the, or if you are on the phone, can you please write a message in the chat function? Well, in the meanwhile, Yvette, uh, while we try to fix this in the interest of time, um, I will actually move to um, uh, our next um, local perspective. Um, Peter Krominga from uh, UPJ, can I maybe uh, give the floor uh, to you? And uh, uh, it will be uh, five uh, minutes, please. And uh, if you can share with us what is the current status of the transposition in Germany, a uh, pretty important country in, within the EU in terms of uh, input of this directive. Peter, the floor is yours. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Pietro. Uh, I will 
just uh, do this in two steps. First, I will uh, talk very shortly about the process uh, of transposition and uh, just uh, a week ago, about a week ago, the German Federal Ministry on Justice and Consumer Protection published a ministerial draft amendment of the commercial, commercial code and some other laws affected uh, to transpose the directive into national law. Uh, before doing that, uh, the ministry uh, published in mid 2015 a concept with a direction it wanted to go and the topics to discuss with stakeholders. A group of around 90 selected stakeholders representing business, finance, NGOs, unions, accountants, and other interest groups like Econsense and UPJ were asked for written comments and to comment at a hearing in late 2015. Now, uh, those stakeholders are asked to comment on uh, the draft uh, amendment uh, of the law. And we expect that uh, the governmental draft will be adopted by the federal cabinet most probably in summer and then submitted to parliament. So we expect uh, the final adoption uh, just in time late this year. Um, if you look at the group of stakeholders uh, which are involved, uh, we see very diverse opinions and also conflicting uh, interests. So uh, finally, it will be up to the, to the ministry and to the government to decide uh, which direction uh, it wants to go. Uh, just a few uh, things about uh, the, or the main lines of the draft uh, legislation. Uh, overall, uh, the Ministry uh, pretends to transpose Directive 1 to 1 international law. But if you look more in detail, there are some uh, widenings. I will just uh, quickly go through. Concerning uh, the scope or the content of the reporting, uh, the Ministry still wants to discuss if consumer protection like that, data privacy and complaints management should be added as an issue to the scope on what to report on. But this is not yet included in the draft. Uh, the draft gives exemplary specifications uh, on, on the matters. Uh, some examples, uh, environmental matters are, for example, specified as CO2 emissions or water usage. Employee-related matters are specified, for example, as equal opportunities, union rights, or health and safety. Uh, like the directive, uh, the specification of, oh, sorry, uh, the specification of social matters is exemplified by the dialogue of local communities and local authorities, as well as the development of local communities surrounding the company. This is an indication of a very broad uh, understanding of materiality, which does not only refer to risks related to the company's operations and uh, economic prospects, but also related to the impact. Of I guess uh, it's not yet uh, fully uh, reflected what, what this means uh, for uh, reporting. Concerning the size, the criteria of uh, the criteria are the same as in, in the directive, and uh, also listed companies, insurances, and banks are included. But there is uh, an addition which follows uh, the systematic of the German commercial commercial code, which also puts certain other legal forms of companies under uh, a broader disclosure obligation. Those are, they are called in German GmbH and Co. KG, uh, which are limited partnerships with a limited liability company as general partner, as well as cooperatives. All other regulations are not surprising. A separate report is permitted. There is a safe harbor clause 
consolidative reporting is admitted, there is a comply or explain regulation, and companies are free to use national or international frameworks as long as all the issues covered by the legislation are also covered by them. An audit is compulsory, not the auditing of the content. In case also the content of the non-financial statement is audited by an accountant, the audit has to be fully finished. Interesting might be uh, the fine defined in case of non-compliance, which is up to uh, 10 million euro or up to 5% of the turnover of, uh, of a business. So, uh, some final uh, remarks. Uh, I guess uh, the definition of materiality will be a challenge uh, for many companies who have to uh, report and I guess it's very important to get uh, European coherence uh, to have uh, an option in any uh, national law for consolidated reporting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we hopefully have fixed the, uh, the issues of getting uh, Richard allowed to speak to us, and we are all eager to, uh, to hear from him. Uh, Richard, uh, are you online now? Can you, um, uh, can you talk to us? Can we hear you? We have him on the line here with us. Wonderful. Thank so thank you very much, Richard. Look forward to, uh, to hear your views about this important milestone and your assessment, your perspective about the uh, national implementation. The floor is yours. Can you hear Richard? Uh, uh, no, very... we hear you, you, but not Richard. Can he okay, Richard? speak Richard, through this phone? Let's just check you are hearing me. I've been listening intently to our Danish and German colleagues, but I just want to check you are hearing me. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. I, I'm going to be brief because one of the reasons I wanted to join this telephone conversation was to listen to the questions and to listen to the practical uh, um, questions that companies have to implement the directive. Thank you for the kind things you said about my own role in relation to the directive. I am indeed proud of it. I believe it's an appropriate piece of regulation that is not burdensome to businesses to implement, but will be helpful uh, in terms of supporting business responsibility. And I do want to say thank you, as always, to my friends and colleagues from CSR Europe who do such a good job, including uh, in organising this event. So what I would say about the directive is there's still time. This is the right time to be thinking about it. Uh, the implementation uh, um, will, will start next year. So you have to start reporting on things that start next year, and then the first reports are in 2018. There's plenty of time, but don't wait till next year to think how you're going to do it. This is the ideal time to start thinking about it. Secondly, uh, don't wait for the guidance and think it's going to answer all the questions, right? But tell the Commission what you want in the guidance, tell your governments and your countries what you'd like, and therefore frame the implementation. But the whole spirit of the directive is not a, a tick box exercise with a list of things you have to write down, and if only you've done it, it's completed. The whole spirit of the directive is to try to get companies to really think about what are the material impacts for them in terms of society, the environment, human rights, anti-corruption diversity, and then to, to actually respond to that as it affects you and your company. So no one can tell you that, no guidance can tell you that, no simple off-the-shelf solution. It's about thinking about that yourselves. And of course, many of you are producing CSR or sustainability reports and have been thinking about it. And it's about building on that, how perhaps you developing that practice within your own company, but also other companies coming on board and joining, joining you. Perhaps some of that are also listening to this conversation. And it's very much in the spirit of what I think people know of as integrated reporting. So the idea that, that although we call it non-financial reporting, actually it's very financial because it's about, in the long run, uh, value creation and saying that if we look at environmental 
management and risks. If we look at societal management and risks, then we can have more successful companies in the long run, financially as well as non-financially. Uh, and many of us believe that, and it's certainly the philosophy behind the, the, the directive. The fact that we can use existing national frameworks like as we've been listening to already in this conversation, the German Sustainability Code and the uh, Danish Reporting Law um, shows that where if you have invested time and thought into this, you don't need to start again, you can build on what you've done already. But in all our countries, including mine, Great Britain, for example, you know, there are things that are slightly different from what we've got at the moment, including, for example, an anti Bribery, and so we're going to have. We'll, you know, each of us will have to just look and, and check what's slightly different, and, and to be ready to uh, adapt to that. Uh, but I suppose the the most important thing I want to say is this: this is we hope part of a reform of in which we have a lower burden, less financial reporting, more material reporting. Uh, that will be more. Um, uh, uh, relevant and material to the company, and it's not about reporting in its own right as an end in itself. It's about reporting to give information to the management of the company as much as anyone outside that will then help change and develop strategy to help companies become more socially and environmentally responsible. Uh, and so I think the, fact, the very fact that you're engaging in this telephone conversation uh, and thinking about it is great. And what I would take away from the phone conference is, is the philosophy and the spirit of this directive. Because uh, um, if, every, if any, every company is simply trying to keep to the spirit, don't worry about, you know, or detail here or there. That's not the idea. The, the idea is not to catch out companies. Uh, the idea is to be helpful and enabling. And I really believe this, 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 uh, as this framework is intended and can achieve that. Thank you very, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for uh, your contribution and uh, for the call to action and for reminding us the the why we've been doing the directive. So, um, uh, incredibly um, uh, inspiring words, uh, as always. I I would add. Um, you were indeed uh, mentioning that you would have been brief, and thank you for being that brief. Before opening the floor to the um, uh, Q&A, and actually at the moment we have 191 participants, so thank you very much for the uh, warm participation to this webinar. Um, I will, before opening for the Q&A, I would like to uh, give the floor to uh, Marina Migliorato uh, from Enel, Italy, uh, to share the uh, business views on the implementation of the directive. Marina, how is um, Enel, you know, working in the implementation, already in the, uh, in the compliance for, for the directive? And uh, what is your perspective on this uh, important milestone in the EU? Marina, we cannot hear you. I will just check with Yvette. Uh, is Marina unmuted? Yes, yeah, she is. Marina, I'm not, but she, I'm, I'm not sure if she can hear us. Marina, can you hear us? Well, if Marina know. is having currently problems uh, with uh, speaking, I will just ask uh, uh, Thomas Serkovic for Etica uh, from Spain. Thomas, why don't you go next and uh, uh, share your um, your thoughts about the initiative? that you have in Spain to uh, promote transparency, integrity, and governance for companies. Thomas, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Pietro. Good afternoon, everybody, and certainly a very sad day for, for everybody, and our sympathies from, from everybody here in Foretica for those who are affected by the horrible situation. So just let me go straight to uh, what we're doing, and just to go on, on practical to what uh, Richard was saying about uh, talking to our governments and making some um, uh, voicing about the, the importance of uh, management uh, above and beyond reporting. What we're trying to do in Spain is a former membership, we have set up a working group, um, as, as, as you can read on the slide, on these three very important uh, issues. So uh, we have just set up the group, which will be 
composed of uh, companies that are affected by the directive and other companies. As you can see, they are like multinationals or privately owned companies. And um, what we want to do uh, with the group that we have just set up is the four things that you can see there. So we want to learn on what's happening outside Spain in terms of uh, best practices on implementing both from a company perspective, so which companies are doing a good job around this, how are they engaging with their suppliers, how they are they engaging with internally functions that are affected by reporting, so not only the, the corporate responsibility area or the compliance area, but throughout the company. Um, and also how are uh, government and public uh, administration uh, supporting in the implementation. So we want to learn and share what's, what's happening outside. We want to conduct research and best practice uh, and, and share that with, with, with our members as well. So for instance, last month we published a, um, a, a project, the, the results of a project which was a, a comparative analysis of a, a whistleblowing or uh, speak up systems within a publicly quoted Spanish companies and we compared those practices with a food C100 UK companies and CAC can't uh, French companies. So just a, a contribution to help advance best practice on, on that specific element of, of integrity. Third, we want to, to, to assume some, some uh, positioning around some of the issues that, as you all know, member states have to decide by themselves. So whether it's about uh, taking a Danish approach on scope or looking at uh, elements of verification or looking at how we can, you know, certainly as Richard was saying earlier, instill that sense that this is not the end in itself, the reporting, but going beyond and improving the management. So um, we're sort of taking advantage of the fact that at the moment, as most of you know, we do not have a government in Spain. So hopefully when the new government has been set up, we have already taken some positioning uh, fed from the best practice, so everything that we can learn from this uh, great uh, GRI CSA Europe initiative will be very useful for us so we can get together, have some common uh, thoughts around it and engage with, with, with government uh, on, on, on how best to, to implement the directive. So just uh, in case you're wondering why transparency, governance and integrity, why, why so many issues, we're working on, on sort of three inputs that are very important for us at, at, at the moment. So obviously the directive is there and all the impetus it has on transparency because as, as you know the, uh, and on, on Pietro's initial slide we have around 100 companies affected by, by the directive but it's just how you will comply is that what, what, what we're worried about and we want to see how, how best to do it uh, and how to be, get best uh, advantage of, of the fact that we have the, we have the directive being, being transposed. We have very little information of what's happening at the Spanish level in terms of the government. We know there's a draft, uh, but that's as far as we have got. However, on the, on the, on the other hand, uh, the Comisión Nacional de Mercado de Valores, which uh, will be the, the regulatory authority for for Spanish uh, stock exchanges had issued at the beginning of last year a good governance code that for the first time had a specific chapter of corporate social responsibility and obviously it's recommendations for quoted companies but very clear recommendations on the need to publicly disclose non-financial data on calling on company directors to uh, uh, adopt a policy on CSR. So very interesting development and just to see how these recommendations can be further uh, promoted to other companies. And finally, the penal code here in Spain on the whole issue of uh, corporate crimes or corporate manslaughter as it's called, uh, how that is affecting companies and how companies need to affect their own risk management system. So we want to take a holistic approach, but obviously the, the directive is, is, is a very important element. As you can see on the next steps, we're taking a, 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 a very public approach to what we're doing. We would welcome any company that wants to, to become part of our group to, to sign up. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a Spanish company affected by the directive. We think that this is about improving and, 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 and aiming for, for best practice. Uh, so more than welcome. I'll be more than happy to share the good governance code, which is also in English for anybody who wants to look at it. And, uh, and finally, just strongly encourage further collaborations through this alliance because I think it's it's essential uh, 
to, to see how, how things evolve and, and to take the best elements of some of the elements uh, like on the Danish experience on on this survey of compliance with with the director I think there's there's a lot of potential so I'll stop here because I know there's much more to add to the conversation but definitely very eager to learn and to share so well done to GRI and CSA Europe for involving us in this Thank you very much, Thomas, um, for your contribution. Uh, we're trying to, uh, to solve the issue that Marina Migliorato from NL um, uh, is having at the moment. Uh, in the meanwhile, um, we are already receiving some questions. Um, uh, for all of you that want to ask questions, you can actually type it in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, it's on your uh, webinar device, just on your window in the lower right part. Um, we have a question about the um, list of uh, public interest entities, whether this list will be uh, made public. Um, uh, when we, um, we skim through, uh, through the slides and we show you the numbers of public listed companies, that was the understanding that we got from the members of the uh, EU non-financial reporting platform. And um, uh, indeed, the list of the companies that are covered by the, uh, by the uh, national implementation should be indeed public, but this is a question that should be addressed to uh, the uh, relevant uh, national government. Um, now, we had as well uh, another question, and was directly to um, um, uh, Louise and Pernil, uh, and it's about the, um, uh, the Danish experience. Uh, so after the long experience in reporting in Denmark, how has the government used the information reported by companies? What, is, what, what benefit has the uh, Danish government gained from this uh, broad implementation? Uh, Luis, uh, Pernil, I don't know whether you want to uh, uh, react on this, if you have any insight on this very element. Well, Luis, here, in, uh, in, as to my knowledge, the government as such has not used the information in the reports, uh, but more again seen reporting as a means of um, means to the end of uh, encouraging companies to be more um, reflective about their work on CSR and uh, and to actually move forward and be transparent about it. Um, so the company, so the government has not as such uh, done any analysis on the content, uh, more on the state of reporting, but obviously a series of um, NGOs and other stakeholders have uh, have been following uh, the, uh, the reporting from the companies. Penila, will you add? I'm mm -hmm. sure you have some uh, additional insights as well. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that that, that recently. Uh, the government introduced that you needed as part of your XBRL reporting to to kind of you know tick um, where the CSR reporting was covered, uh, which of course means that you will be able to search for the information and, and much more easily get access to it as as an external stakeholder. Um, so I think going forward there will be new opportunities for for using the reporting um, as as requested through the through the director. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I will now just check whether Marina um, is online and has access to um, to the um, to the well, if she, she has the floor, Yvette. Uh, you know, if Marina is online and can speak. Unfortunately, we are unable to reach her. We've tried to call in directly, but she's not reachable. Okay. So I suggest we move on and yeah. yeah. Okay. Personally, we cannot. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, maybe we will do another try. In the meanwhile, there are a lot of other questions. Uh, one is about the uh, the scope. So whether the criteria of the uh, 500 employees and the public interest is a uh, criteria that should be uh, combined, or either or will qualify company to uh, uh, be part of the scope. Um, I don't know. Maybe um, uh, does anybody? Um, uh, uh, want to um, uh, to take on this? Maybe uh, uh, Jan. I don't know whether you want to uh, to uh, react on this one. Yes, well, I was more willing to complete the answer from our Danish friends regarding um, the question about is the government using that now? Okay, please. What we have, what we have to remember is that Denmark has uh, a ten years is ten years ahead with the legislation they had already. Uh, some uh, while ago, and well, from the continuous discussions we have had with, and I think he's known to you, Victor Kiev and his team, 
um, they have explained how they have been using uh, some of the information in order to analyze and identify where are some existing gaps, understand why is it for some sector companies more difficult than others to report on the materiality of, of issues, uh, why is it maybe more difficult for uh, some more medium companies, why, uh, why was the question how then to translate that into some tools as it was mentioned and there is a European, there is a national strategy in Denmark on that are including tools and capacity building sessions and I think that this is the demonstration of what I would call a smart legislation which is not only a piece of text uh, setting uh, I would say the uh, rules of the game but it is to train to help and train the people to be uh, smart and handy about reporting not as an end but as a mean so that is something that we witness in that country in some other countries it's starting but it's certainly not yet what we see at a regional European level but I will take a point further on uh, a little bit later. Thank you very much Jan and um, just you know uh, maybe I can provide a very short answer to the question about the scope and indeed the criteria uh, of the 500 and the public interest is indeed a combined criteria. So a company that has more than 500 employees and is a public um, uh, listed public interest uh, company, um, this qualifies the company to be part of the scope. Uh, said that, uh, please be reminded that the national implementation by the member states can define, can enlarge the scope. So uh, it will be important always to, um, to keep an eye on the uh, national implementation. We have another question, and uh, it's about the uh, relevance of the uh, global de facto ESG reporting standard that GRI uh, represents. Um, what is the relevance of basically GRI for the directive? Uh, and I, I will uh, just, you know, take the, um, uh, give the floor to myself basically to answer this question. And um, indeed, uh, GRI is among the standards referenced in the uh, recitals of the uh, directive. Uh, those of you that have, a, that have had a close look to the, of the, uh, to the directive will, note, will have noted that indeed among the uh, um, uh, frameworks referred in the directive, there is a UN Global Compact, OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises, uh, EMAS. So there are, there are a lot of tools that companies can use. Uh, but indeed, among those refer, referenced in the directive, uh, GRI represents the um, reporting uh, standard. Uh, provided that uh, we've been uh, indeed, you know, uh, participating in the um, uh, uh, creation and the, in the uh, adoption of this directive, uh, we really felt the need of explaining to the many companies that have been knocking at our door, uh, asking us for more direction, just to be ready to report. We've been creating actually a um, linkage document between the uh, EU directive and the uh, uh, GRI at that time, G4 guidelines, and as many of you know, uh, we are transitioning to the uh, GRI standards in 2016. Um, indeed, we, uh, we saw that there is a um, um, full compat compatibility between the GRI standards and the directive. Uh, therefore, companies that want to uh, already start um, uh, reporting according to the directive can seek guidance uh, through this publication that you can find on our website or you can uh, easily go to uh, www.globalreporting.org slash EU policy and you will find all our EU information there. Um, I think that now we actually, no, I, I'm just getting a no. Unfortunately, uh, we are still having problems uh, having Marina online. So we will go to the uh, next uh, uh, question and uh, it was about, uh, if you can, uh, the question is directed to uh, Peter, and it's if we can repeat what we said about auditing in Germany. Peter, uh, can you please uh, repeat your point about auditing in Germany? Yes, okay. Uh, I, uh, I also see there a question about the frequency uh, for reporting, and uh, uh, the frequency, frequency will be uh, the annual report to which uh, the uh, non-financial report has to be uh, attached and uh, it's annual annually and if it comes to auditing uh, 
it is uh, if you follow the draft, and it's only a draft, and we will see if it uh, finally uh, will come to that, uh, the non-financial report has to, has to be audited, but not the content. But if the content is audited by an accountant, uh, then the full report or the full audit uh, has to be published uh, in the in the non-financial report. And coming uh, to the def definition of public interest uh, entities, uh, the German draft even goes beyond that because the systematic of the commercial code already now uh, puts certain other entities like uh, cooperatives uh, under the same uh, disclosure obligations like uh, capital-oriented uh, entities. So uh, the number of, uh, if this draft will become law, we will have, I guess, more than a thousand more companies which have to, uh, to report on non-financials. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, we have another question related to uh, state-owned companies. What if, uh, whether, you know, uh, if any of the uh, EU member states has expanded the uh, um, scope of the directive to uh, state-owned companies? I can tell you from my side that during the negotiations at some point, uh, the issue of state-owned companies came up. And indeed, you know, the point was um, while regulating uh, Maybe the, um, uh, the governments uh, should uh, first look at their own assets. And, uh, and, and I can tell you as well that, you know, there are many state-owned companies that are already transparent about uh, their uh, sustainability impacts. In particular, in Sweden, um, it is uh, mandated uh, to state-owned companies to disclose sustainability information. Um, uh, but whether other member states have been uh, um, uh, considering to enlarge the state-owned companies, um, I don't know, Jan, maybe uh, you have uh, from CSR Europe an idea about um, uh, this uh, development in your dialogue with a uh, uh, different national government. Jan, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Yeah, so it, it will be defined in national law huh? what falls under this so-called listed public entities. And indeed, already in some countries, uh, public state-owned companies are part of the definition, not automatically, but uh, very often. And indeed, um, countries like Sweden having the tradition to have already a kind of mandatory reporting for state-owned uh, companies will only continue. So that will be, again, a verification country by country. It's each country that is responsible for the definition of what he believes is a listed public entity. Um, that is what we we find out. Uh, and we know that there are countries that are being supported by the Commission to also exchange how is it that each of the governments are starting to fine-tune their definitions or bring some change to the definitions of um, this so-called public entity. Um, yeah, that's that's so far, at least on my side. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go. We'll move to the uh, next question, which is pretty similar. is about the uh, expansion of the scope uh, to a lower threshold of number of employees. Um, indeed, you know, um, uh, um, the uh, definition of large entities uh, in the EU is traditionally 250 employees, but the directive. Uh, cover companies with more than 500 employees. Um, so the question is whether there are um, uh, some member states that are expanding in that in that direction. Um, in the discussions that I had recently with uh, some of the member states, uh, some of them have been checking what are the numbers of companies um, affected by by the legislation. And uh, indeed, when where the uh, the number has been uh, uh, low, they've been questioning themselves about expanding the scope, meaning trying to get more companies, for example, lowering the, the 500 
uh, employees threshold. But uh, so far, um, uh, as we shared already, in terms of uh, the countries that uh, have been implementing, um, Slovakia and Estonia have indeed, you know, kept the minimum uh, threshold, uh, while Denmark has been uh, uh, changing the, uh, the the kind of scope. Maybe uh, um, Louise or Pernil again, uh, would you like to share, you know, your thoughts about the uh, um, uh, the threshold of the number of employees? Yvette, can you please unmute uh, Louise or Pernille? Yes, I can. Um, Louise is unmuted and so is yes. Pernille. Yes. Thank you. Could you just yes. repeat the question again? I was uh, yes. just distracted for a moment. <laughs> no worries. Uh, uh, the question is about the um, uh, lowering the scope, uh, sorry, lowering the threshold of number of employees to enlarge the scope of the uh, uh, directive. Uh, what, what, what has been the, um, the approach in Denmark? Uh, what is the threshold at the moment in terms of number of employees? Well, I think the, the logic for, for including companies down to 250 uh, employees was that they are already reporting according to, to the existing Danish reporting framework. Um, so either we would be working with two parallel different frameworks for the large ones and the medium ones, or, or make it the same framework. So, so that's why um, that's why the you can say the medium-sized companies down to 250. They they are, you know, um, so they they will be reporting from 2018 according to the EU directive standards. So I think so. So the logic has mostly been not necessarily to include more companies but to have the same kind of framework for all the companies in Denmark who are already reporting, but just with a, with a delay, you can say, in time or a transition period. Thank you very much. And indeed, you are covering a, a very uh, uh, important point, which is the review in 2018. Uh, indeed, in the, uh, uh, in the directive, uh, it is already scheduled, scheduled a review of the um, uh, non-financial reporting in 2018. Therefore, the scope might be changed in, uh, in that moment. Uh, just to tie back to the question about the state on companies, uh, we actually got information uh, in the chat from uh, uh, Christian Danko that in, apparently in uh, uh, Romania, um, there is intention to extend the scope to uh, state on companies. Um, uh, thank you very much for sharing this with us. And uh, indeed, you know, uh, this is the richness of, of our platform, having, you know, uh, many of us in different countries to uh, uh, share the knowledge with the others. Uh, I will move to another question that is um, uh, about the uh, litigation. Um, uh, there is apparently, well, there is a trend, a growing trend of litigation directed against companies um, uh, regarding information published in uh, CSR reports, sustainability reports. Is there a risk that with a more disclosure, companies will be more exposed to legal action? Uh, is the EU directive just a way to enrich lawyers? Um, I, um, I don't know among the, um, the, the panelists uh, who would like to, um, uh, to, to take this on. Uh, Thomas, maybe uh, it would be good to hear your voice once again if you have a take on this. Thank you, Pietro. Well, I, 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 I think like in anything, there's always a, a, a business for somebody. But, but I guess the, the perspective we have here in Spain is that for most companies affected by a directive, many of which are our member companies, they are already doing this. They have already been doing a sustainability reports. Most of them, if not all of them, are, are, are aligned with GRI. So we think it's going to be just a small, you know, add on to, 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 to add on to the, to, to the compliance. So, um, I, I, I don't think so. And then on, on the point of, um, of litigation specifically, I, um, I, I I, I don't think that I think it depends maybe on the on the culture of of the different countries, but the the culture here in Spain is not very strong on on, on litigation and uh, and as as far as I have spoken to companies, they wouldn't be concerned 
that the directive is opening a space for more for more or different channels of uh, of, of of litigation. On the contrary, I think they're they're looking forward to some more clarity and, and a better scope for for dialogue with different stakeholders. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Um, uh, my two cents contribution on this. Uh, I'm a lawyer myself. And I think that there is not that big risk that the directive is um, making a business for for lawyers. Um, in um, I believe that you know the transparency uh, indeed poses a question of liability, but as part of the accountability dynamic. Um, uh, in the past, we've been uh, questioned uh, more and more by by lawyers about this uh, element of. Uh, compliance and uh, um, possible litigation. In the directive, there is anyway the uh, safe harbor clause, which allows companies to uh, uh, refrain from publishing information that are anyway um, uh, confidential information or that could harm their position. So um, uh, I believe that there is not a high risk, but on the other side, um, maybe it's good that there is this kind of tension because indeed the uh, report, this will contribute to the quality of information disclosed. We don't want just reports with uh, uh, glossy um, uh, uh, images and uh, uh, covering um, uh, elements that um, are only positive for the organization. One of the uh, principles in the reporting is in the balance of information. Therefore, having a public scrutiny and having um, uh, the um, uh, even the, um, uh, the, the, the the tension of possibly being sued, maybe that is one element that could uh, raise the bar of the quality of reports. Uh, last question, uh, I've been given signs that this is the last one because we need to um, uh, respect everybody's time and uh, we had agreed to close the, uh, the webinar by uh, 4.15. And the last question is about the uh, um, uh, uh, incentives or rewards that national governments are uh, envisioning for those companies that are indeed reporting. Any tax, tax concessions for compliance? Uh, very difficult question, I think. Uh, I don't have um, an answer uh, in mind. Um, I don't know whether um, maybe, uh, Peter, is this uh, something that has been at all discussed in uh, Germany? Would you like to, uh, to share your views if you are aware of anything? No, yet uh, this has not yet uh, discussed uh, in Germany. Uh, it will be a legislation, a law, and uh, the companies will have to comply to the law. And uh, the government says it's uh, in the interest of, of, of the public uh, to get more uh, transparency about uh, company operations. So. Uh, uh, that's uh, why there's also a quite high, there are high fines if uh, companies do not uh, comply to the law. So uh, the only one uh, what is uh, planned by the government is a kind of, is an award, not a reward, but an award on a good uh, company reporting. But that's it. Thank you very much, Peter. So we can uh, finally uh, go to the close of the uh, webinar, and I would like to give the floor to uh, Jan uh, Notre Dame uh, about the uh, next steps of the uh, European Commission CSR strategy. Uh, this was already mentioned. I think it's a very important step for uh, the looks at the uh, next coming years. So Jan, uh, can you please share with us uh, your understanding about the uh, EU CSR strategy or responsible business strategy? Yes, thank you, Petro. And indeed, on the 3rd of March, there was a meeting that was co-hosted by Richard Howitt and Commissioner Bienkowska on uh, where, where are we with the next step of the EU CSR strategy. Uh, there are still some doubts on that. Uh, there was, uh, however, some discussions, of course, on the transparency uh, directive. And there, uh, Teresa Falkenberg from the GRI, but also some others, and Etienne Davignon from CSR Europe, took quite a strong uh, stance, uh, Richard Howitt as well, I must say. Um, so besides the fact that the Commission will continue to support governments in the process of transposition, and there's still a long way to go for that, uh, besides that, and besides the efforts of the Commission to develop some non-binding guidelines 
uh, after the consultation that we have mentioned and that is open until the 15th of uh, April. Besides that, uh, we heard for the very first time uh, both uh, DG Grow and DG FISMA telling how concerned they are with uh, the numbers of enterprises telling that they are not ready for complying in a uh, relevant or uh, eff effective way with the directive. So they start to be preoccupied. Uh, it's something that we say since 2012 that uh, a legislation uh, which has not uh, which is not backed up by a strong strategy on capacity building is what uh, we would call not a smart legislation but maybe a very lazy or even a naive legislation because the risk we have mentioned it uh, it can generate mandatory window dressing reports that can be made only by consultants so you don't internalize the whole process which we believe reporting is about it's a way it's a management process to internalize sustainability and CSR across the functions up to the board um, and it has also the risk uh, sometimes to isolate the whole uh, effort of transparency with the legal affairs that is asked to do the uh, minimum risk transparency practice and, and maybe just doing some of the tick boxing using some of the reference uh, tools. So, we clearly have identified that as a major risk, not only for the companies directly impacted by the directive, but also by the many more customers and suppliers oh. of these companies that will get the pressure uh, on their shoulders uh, clearly. That's what we hear from more and more companies. So that is why uh, we are continuing to hammer the need to include in the future CSR action plan of the EU, a strong or more, uh, maybe not one, but maybe two or three strong actions that can support and the companies, of course, but maybe also the investors to make best use of this uh, non-financial information, but maybe also governance, what to do in a smart way with the information uh, that will be provided by the company. So we will continue the dialogue. Uh, Etienne Darigno has been challenging the Commission to be ready uh, with an action plan before the end of June 2016. In fact, it is before the end of the Dutch EU presidency, so that we take the full benefit of a government that on transparency has been very smart over the past, especially when you look also how the Dutch government, since a couple of years, has been developing this so-called um, transparency benchmark that is uh, pushing companies to use a benchmark to see where they are in terms of quality process of reporting. Uh, and that is something that we are also looking at because we believe that from such a benchmark that you can extend to uh, maybe a first range of countries and then more and more countries, that is what is going to produce some juice, I would mean some analysis of what is out there in the business community with regard to quality reporting uh, towards also more integrated reporting. So we will continue to hammer that, uh, not so easy, uh, uh, they seem to be waking up and express some worry, but that doesn't translate yet. Uh, the Commission in the capacity to think what could be some good actions to be undertaken. Having said that, uh, there is, uh, we believe, also some complementary efforts from the EU side that can help accelerate uh, also the directive uh, implementation. That's the so-called shareholder rights directive. It has been already voted by the Parliament. It's on hold for the moment. They are waiting to make progress uh, on the uh, so-called country-by-country reporting directive proposal. But in a nutshell, this directive on the shareholder rights is about making the investors also more transparent about the way they take their decisions uh, in a more sustainable and in a more medium or long-term way. And this by asking them to also use the non-financial information of the companies they have in their portfolio. So that is one 
uh, important initiative to, 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 to watch. Then some of you have been uh, seeing also the latest developments from the EU uh, regarding tax transparency. Um, we will display for our members uh, some visuals summarizing all the steps that have been taken in the last couple of months and what is ahead in the, in the next uh, period. But you can see the Commission is soon to come out with a legislative proposal for an anti-tax avoidance uh, directive and it is also coming out with a legislative proposal for a common consolidated corporate tax base. These are only two examples directly uh, speaking to companies. So we also know that in the directive on non-financial information, as it was said, in 2018 in the review, uh, the Commission will be asked uh, by the Parliament or its asked by the Parliament and the Council to also consider uh, what any further steps should be taken with regard to tax transparency. And uh, last but not least, some of you have been following also the uh, EU Directive proposal on the conflict minerals, which is also uh, here a strong focus uh, with more transparency across the whole value chain uh, in this uh, sector. So. Uh, the non-financial directive is part of a wider um, uh, policy on more transparency from the private sector and uh, this is not there to stop. If you also see, of course, uh, the agenda of the G20 on sustainable supply chains uh, or if you look at the OECD uh, agenda and, of course, the latest SDGs. Uh, that are also asking for more transparency. So uh, it is almost all written in the stars and that is why we are really looking to continue with all the national networks, with all the leading companies that so far have been supportive for transparency together with the GRI, how can we get uh, at the European level uh, some of the right actions to be decided so that we can continue to give uh, good support for quality reporting. I will end here because we are really reaching the limit of um, the timing and uh, at least on my side, a big thank you to all the colleagues uh, here in Brussels but also there in the GRI who have made this possible. We are considering next steps, maybe in summertime, uh, because there we will know uh, if the Commission in its CSR action plan will have uh, included a specific action on the capacity building for uh, transparency. But wait and see, and we will come back to all of you. But uh, Pietro, please, uh, the word uh, for the closing is maybe yours. Yeah, no, thank you very much. I will just compliment uh, not abusing the patience of uh, all the many uh, participants to the, uh, to the webinar. So today we have heard um, different perspectives. We have heard about the uh, implementation, the status of the implementation of the Union Financial Directive, the views and updates from the, some of the uh, countries in Europe. We have heard about from Germany, from Denmark. Um, uh, I'm sorry that we, uh, we missed uh, Marina uh, from, um, uh, from NL in Italy. Um, uh, Jan, uh, help us to, uh, to understand a bit the, uh, the larger uh, picture. Uh, so what is happening on the uh, CSR strategy? What are the ne next steps? And indeed, the, um, uh, the question that was uh, put uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to all of us, uh, what uh, to do with the information. Indeed, this shareholder rights um, a proposal that, you know, currently the European Commission is proposed, is, is evaluating, indeed touches upon this. So how can the information disclosed by companies be used by uh, shareholders and uh, by investors? Um, uh, how can, can this be, be used to assess contribution of the private sector to, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the agenda, as uh, Jan mentioned, that it will, is the agenda that will inform the Sustainable Development for the next uh, uh, 15 years. Uh, let me um, close thanking uh, all the speakers, uh, Luis, Pernil, Peter, Thomas, um, uh, Marina, sorry for um, not having been able to, um, uh, to hear from you. We will just uh, uh, have the opportunity to, um, to hear from you, I'm pretty sure, in the next opportunity. 
And uh, Richard, thank you very much for making the time uh, to, um, uh, to inspire us with, uh, with your words. Um, let me uh, just thank you all of you once again for the overwhelming participation. Uh, we had indeed a total of uh, 190 uh, people participating, which uh, gives us the feeling of uh, what we're doing is indeed needed. So uh, thank you very much, and thank you for the rich contribution of all the members of the EU non-financial uh, reporting platform. Uh, please uh, stay in touch with us. Uh, you can see here the um, uh, web, uh, web links to the uh, uh, portals of CSR Europe and Global Reporting Initiative um, about you know, our EU uh, work. For those of you who will be uh, um, uh, coming to Amsterdam for our global conference, the GRI Global Conference, uh, from the um, 18th to the 20th of May 2016, we will have a session about the EU. We'll have the um, honor to um, host uh, Richard in person, as well as representatives from the uh, European Commission. So that's, of course, you know, only one of the elements on the agenda. But I really look forward to um, keep in touch with all of you and uh, uh, look forward to our next uh, public webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, CCR Europe. Thank you very much, everybody, uh, also from our side. And one final, final note, we will share also the, the slides, as it was a question from some people. We will share the slides with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Beth. Goodbye, everybody. Uh, Have a nice day.